Good morning, everyone. Um, this session is about the Joomla trademark policy and uh, process recommendations. It's basically a update um, of where we're at um, with this process and some discussion afterwards on, on some of the recommendations and, and ideas that, that we are moving forward on. Um, my name is Jacques Renske. Um, I'm not a lawyer um, and this is not legal advice. Um, I serve on the board of uh, Open Source Matters. Um, I've been on the board since 2010. Um, I've previously served as secretary of the board and vice president of the board and uh, for the last few years I've also been um, in charge of the trademark team. Open Source Matters. I think most of you would know what Open Source Matters is. Um, the non-profits that when the project was started, this uh, non-profit was formed to manage the finances and the legal aspects of the project to all the trademarks and so on. Um, we part of the sort of three part structure, leadership structure of, of Joomla. Core responsibilities is the finances, legal uh, contracts, uh, owning, managing the assets, which includes the trademarks and domains, investigating breaches of license, uh, copyright and trademark. Um, at the start of this process, um, which started some time ago, um, the board outlined several key um, goals in uh, revamping the trademark process. Um, I've got them listed there. It's keep control of the trademark, allow proper community use, prevent abuse and fraudulent use, retain discretion to end or stop offending use, shorten time frame for trademark decision making, increase uniformity of access to the trademark and reduce resources devoted to trademarks, both for OSM and the community. That last one is, is, is quite important. Um, Joomla is a organization that's there to make good software that people can use and uh, through that use sometimes help make society better also. And we always want to, to guard against us shifting too much resources into a direction that's not the main focus of what Joomla is about. So whether it's people's time or, or the organization's money, we want to balance it against what, what the main purpose and goal of, of the Joomla project is. So why, do we, why did we embark on this uh, policy review process? What, what was our, our motivation? To get to that, one, one needs to look at the history of, of Joomla and the Joomla trademark. Um, as most of you would know, Joomla is a, is a fork from um, a software called Mambo. Um, it was a GPL licensed software and um, at the time that it forked in 2005 or the process started for the fork, um, this new baby did not have a name yet. Um, there was no open source matters. So the process of, of the organization, the legal entity and the name only came after the fork. And during the time of the fork and so shortly thereafter, there, there was a, a need to, to, to keep a, or maintain a continuity between the the people who were involved in Mambo at that time and those who, who were joining the fork into Joomla. And part of that necessitated allowing certain practices that were common in, in the Mambo world to continue over into Joomla, which included 
using the name of the software in product names, in company names, in URLs. Um, so it was a fairly permissive use of the trademark that, that was under Mamba and that continued on into um, Joomla at, at the start of the project. Now the information that's available for for managing the the pro uh, for uh, managing uh, or for uh, the information that's available for the trademark the rules the policies those are currently spread out over a number of pages on um, open source matters and some of it is also on on joomla.org um, pages on the trademark policy, name and logo use, conditional use logos, business conditional use. The pages are a bit difficult to understand. Some of it contradicts itself. Uh, there's contradictions between what is said on one page and what's said on the next page. Um, in the end, it creates confusion, needless requests and non-compliance. So in the trademark team, we deal with people who are totally confused with what our rules really say, people who apply for things that they don't have to apply for, um, and people who simply don't comply, possibly one reason, just because they don't understand the, the rules that they're supposed to follow. Um, the current policy that Open Source Matters has adopted was adopted to, in an effort to achieve simplicity. Um, the name uh, logo used, the conditional use logos, that page on Open Source Matters that lists the number of conditional use logos that you can use under certain circumstances for certain use without registering. Um, all of that was an attempt to to try and make things a bit simpler and, and to solve certain problems at the time. Um, part of the problem we're sitting with today is that over time various things were added to the policy and, and the rules each time with, with a genuine um, reason behind it to, to try and solve things or make things easier or simpler. But the end effect of it was that we're sitting with a accumulation of different policies and documents and things on our website which which is not one cohesive policy and, and which uh, leads to, to some um, confusion and some misunderstandings in, in what, what it is one can and can't do. When we look at controlling the mark, um, it is not an easy question to, to answer what, how do we control this mark. Part of it because of the history of, of the, the trademark, how, what we allowed at the start of the project and, and how that evolved over time and, and some of the changes that came in afterwards. Um, and in part also to do with the cost of, of registering the trademark in different countries. Um, at a time when um, Elon was the president of OSM, um, OSM followed a fairly um, aggressive uh, policy of registering the trademark in, in uh, quite a number of countries. Um, and it's, it's been useful to having those registrations when, when the need were there to, to, to address the issue in those countries. But it's also an expensive thing to, to keep, keep doing. And um, as, as we've sort of found out over time that it's, it's not as simple as, as only having something registered in one class, in one, you, Someone can come and they register it in a different class and uh, it's, it's a whole new thing that you have to deal with then. Um, but it's still that that's, uh, sort of baseline uh, registrations, especially in the major countries, uh, of course in the US where the organizations uh, 
legal entities, uh, but also in Europe and a number of other countries, that, that baseline does help us to enforce it. Um, there's often when we deal with a company where we don't have the trademark registered, then one of the the supporting factors that we can rely on is that we do have it registered in other countries. Um, so that, that is something that, that, that is useful and, and that um, has helped us also in the past. Um, we, however, constantly need to balance the resources that we use to secure and maintain registration against the opportunity costs of foregoing investing those resources into further development and community. So it's are we spending our time and money on, on, on building community or are we spending it on chasing legal issues? It's, it's, a, it's a difficult balance to, to keep. And, and yeah, do we, do we want to spend all our resources on, on lawyers or do we want to spend it on making the communities and, e and the local communities so strong that, that, that those who want to arm the, the brand are sort of pushed down in or, or, or less visible. Yes. But you, you, you do not spend too much money to protect your trademark. Yeah. Your trademark is without any value because it can be rejected. Yeah. It has no more value because you don't fight against people who are doing illegal use of your trademark. So it's mandatory by the trademark that you fight against the people who are doing a wrong use of your trademark. Yeah. If you don't, your trademark has no value and can be removed. Yeah. So you have to do it and spend, unfortunately, a lot of money to protect it. Yeah. So j just to repeat for the recording, the, the comment was that, that it, it is mandatory to, to protect a trademark from, uh, from abuse. Uh, if, if one doesn't do it, you can lose the, uh, the trademark itself. And, and um, I think that that's a question that we've had to deal with in the past. And, and the way we've, we've looked at it is which, which are the battles that are that are worth fighting, which, which are the, and, and it is a, a choice that, that, that we have to make. We, um, we don't have unlimited resources to spend on legal. Um, so we, we get fairly good, well, we get very good advice from um, mainly two organizations. The one is our, our paid uh, lawyers, uh, WTP, who advises us and, and helps us in, in, legal, in legal cases. Um, and the other one being the Software Freedom Law Center, which provides pro bono assistance to those in the open source and f uh, free and libre software world. So, we get very good advice from them, and um, I think so far we've 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 managed to to keep that balance. Now, one one of the issues, and 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 that that comes in 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 the example you mentioned, or, or in in what you spoke about, we, that we have to defend the the. Um, that we have to defend the, the trademark or action where action is needed. The, the problem we deal with is that we also still want to allow the community to use the mark, um, both for historical reasons and because that's, that's the way the Joomla project and many other uh, open source projects operate, that there is a, a permissiveness in uh, that that's quite different from from normal companies normal companies microsoft all the big brands that you can think of they would not allow most of the the, the use of of their brands that that's allowed in 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 community based organizations like joomla and other open source ones um, so we, we're looking at preventing abuse, fraud, offense, while still um, allowing people to use the mark. 
And one of the changes that we're looking at introducing is at the moment you have to submit a form and then you have to wait till someone replies to that and there's perhaps some changes that you have to make on your website or some extra information and after some time you then may receive approval. Um, the change we're looking at making is to turn the process a bit upside down so that we make it clearer what type of things you need registration for and what things you don't need registration for. And similar to, to a way Drupal also does it. Um, and then for those things that you need registration, change the process so that when someone submits an uh, application um, within the guidelines that's provided for them to submit the application, um, that application is deemed to be approved unless the trademark team within 14 days comes back to that person and say this and this and this needs, uh, needs to change before we can approve or sorry, the, what you want approval for, we, we can't approve. Um, what it does is, is, is that it, it removes that, that waiting time that people sometimes have to deal with and, and a waiting time that sometimes influence other processes in the project like getting listed on the JET or um, Joke Directory or Joomla Day. Um, it, it does put a bit more pressure on us to perform and to, to keep within that time frame. But it's, I, I think it's a, it's a good process in that it's, it's for the person and, and specifically the person who, who wants to comply, who wants to, to follow the rules. It, it makes it for that person much easier and, and it gives them certain parameters, certain things that they can and often if someone for a business uh, wants to use the, then, then they've, they've got their deadlines also, they've got their uh, processes. So it gives them that certainty. Yeah. So Ruth. Point, is, would it not be better to say we will deal with your request in 14 days than mm -hmm. approve? And if I'm a business, I say, right, okay, I'm launching my business, launch the website, then you come back and say you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And I've already spent all the time and money and effort to launch my website because it said it's been approved. Mm. Um, and just a suggestion, yeah. if you're saying you'll review them in 14 days, the problem I've had with the trademark policy approval is not knowing mm. when the approval will happen and having no communication. If you say, we will respond within 14 days, mm. then I can say, okay, we have to wait a few weeks, fine. Yeah. Um, so it may be something to ask the people who have used the trademark what would be the best approach. Yeah. It might be best to automatically approve them, mm. uh, but it may be that saying 14 days is the period we have to wait uh, gives people that confidence that um, they know where they stand. It's a good point, and, and understand when I when I share these these uh, proposals that that they're not set in stone, that, that one of the reasons for having this session is, is to get feedback on them and, and um, you know, when we sort of very involved in something, there's certain way of looking at something wh which someone that looks at it from a different perspective um, can give you something else to, to consider in the process. So I, I, I agree that, that what you said, it, it makes sense that um, if we have the automatic approval and then someone goes ahead and launches something based on that and we then 14 days later said no, 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 but we can't, that, you know, that, that messes things up for that, mm -hmm. that individual or that company. Um, so that is something to, to think about again and, and perhaps just tweak it a bit to so that everyone in the process sort of is, is happy.
was told otherwise, mm. and therefore the team wouldn't have to be quite as on top of, mm. wouldn't have to be quite as uh, dedicated to mm. getting the approvals because people could they could say, well, they should have seen that they're approved, therefore we don't have to get, we don't have to worry about people who didn't really need to ask for approval in the first place. We can just mm. ig- not ignore them, but we can just leave them alone, and we can more focus on the ones that don't get approved or that need to be. And so by going for the automatic approval, you get that. But I understand and agree with the point mm. that it would be better to have a stamp of approval, but yet then you mm. don't get mm. the goal of the automatic approval. Mm. So, so for the sake of the recording, I, I'm just repeating that your concern is that we uh, this suggestion still leaves us with the same amount of work for, for the team. Um, I think there, there it would be important to to divide the different things that approval is needed or not needed so that there's more things that do not require approval when it falls within certain parameters and certain use cases. So that those should be the type of things that, that shouldn't have to be dealt with with someone specifically. And the others still really do need someone to, to have a look at it and um, s- see if it, if it fits the, the rules that it's under. So yeah, it, it would be a case of more splitting it up into different types where, where one you wouldn't need approval and for the other one you, you do need, but it's uh, um, us committing to doing it in a certain time frame. Um, one important part of this, I don't have it mentioned on the slide, but it's an important part of this, this new um, proposal for the process, and that would be that these um, approvals would have to be reviewed by the trademark team on a yearly basis. Um, the requirement would, would not be there for the business or the person submitting again, but but in order for us to to maintain the required control that we need to have over the use of our trademark, um, and specifically because we allow it to be used in a very broad and permissive way, um, we as Open Source Matters and the trademark team would then be required on a yearly basis to have a look again at the website or uh, where it is used and <coughs> and and uh, sorry and determine is is this still um, falling within the rules um, the part that goes with it and it's it's really always been part of the trademark approval is is that the pr- approval can also be withdrawn if someone is not following the the trademark rules anymore, but that that's not really different from from what we have at the moment. Now, part of the suggestions of making things simpler, making things um, easier. Um, office hours. I don't know how many people are familiar with that term. I've I've seen it used in a few organisations, but it it's basically the idea that you have something like. IRC or some modern day equivalent of that. Um, I don't know how many people really hang out on IRC anymore. It's it's sort of become a sort of for the Uber geeks to to (laughs) yeah. So the idea is to have um, volunteers in 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 a sort of a shift rotation basis be present on something like IRC, a specific chat room, or however one sets it up. One, one can use IRC through a web interface also, if, if that is the me- medium we choose to use. But then have those people from the team available to answer questions, trademark-related questions in a, in a live uh, question and answer, so that some of the things that need quick you know, someone just have a quick question that they need to have an answer for before they move on, and, and, and that would be a way for them to, to get that answered. Um, the 
one benefit of it is that the trademark activity would be more in the public view the, um, and through that people would also be able to get an idea of perhaps the thinking of certain decisions or, or learn from the answers that's given to other people. Um, Real-time help also um, and also limit the uh, time commitment of volunteers. Um, linked to that would be getting those things into like things like a FAQ, sort of taking from those those live help sessions the type of questions that often come up and, and using them in, in our documentation online um, so that if, if the same question comes again one can easily point someone to, to the, the answer that's uh, already been provided previously. Um, other way would of, of helping the community would be simpler, a simple visual documentation. Um, that could include something like a flowchart. Um, so you would look at a flowchart and, and it would tell you this for, for this use you can get permission outright. You don't need to fill in a form and apply for that. For this one you need a conditional license um, or, or under a conditional license you can use it. Um, examples of that would be badges like powered by Joomla and um, certain predefined badges that one could allow people to use in certain circumstances without uh, registering and then other use cases where you would need to um, require registration. Um, what would be useful also then would be in that flow chart, that process chart, that it also links out to um, documentation where if someone wants more information on, on what exactly is meant by uh, something that's described in a, in a certain use that they can go to a, a linked page and, and get a bit better or, or more extensive explanation of, of uh, what would fit in that use. Uh, now, some of this can be either internal or external or both. I, I, I see the situation where some of this may be a type of internal flowchart for, for the trademark team to use to review certain things. Um, and the idea is also that this type of uh, document or visual representation would not be a static thing but would be thing, uh, something that we can adapt and make better as, as people, as there's certain things that we need to deal with that we haven't thought of before so that as, as it time goes along we, we refine this document to, to try and cover most of the different uses that, that we know of so that there's a lot more information out there for people without having to ask us and so that there's more consistency in the, the answers that we give because there's already now a written down answer for a certain question and you don't have the problem then of, uh, then of every second trademark team person giving a different answer to the to the same question. Um, transparency, that's, that's a word that that's we often hear um, in the Joomla community and uh, people often call for more transparency and um, what what is important with this idea of a, of a flowchart is is not only that it, it gives people information on on how sort of what path to follow or how to or, or that or, or just the rules or make it more clearer but that it helps them understand the process and, and that's where the transparency comes in that that it's that it makes it very clear to people um, what to expect from the process 
So uh, at at the moment the process is 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 horrible. You you sub you, 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 it's true. You submit a form and I think on some of the form nothing happens. So so there's not a, a thank you. There's not a reply. There's there's just nothing. It's just you don't know if it you know if if uh, the cat ate it or if it's you know what what happened to the submission. Uh, it could be in a spam box for all you know. So um, we want to, it to be clear what the process is so that people know sort of the steps, what, what they can expect. They know the time frame that it's supposed to happen in. Um, we want to have the terms that we use uh, clearly defined. Um, when, it's, when we talk on the website about a simple disclaimer, then it needs to be clearly stated this is what the simple disclaimer is and this is what should be used everywhere and at at the moment there's sort of a few different versions of of the disclaimer floating around and um i think it's sort of evolved over the years what the disclaimer is but um it's not good enough really to just tell someone you have to have a disclaimer you have to put that on there what's the specific disclaimer and everyone sticks to that and then it's easier for everyone to to follow the same rules um, so the the correct text what people should be used uh, part of this involves updating uh, some templates we may use in communication so that if someone gets approval or if someone gets a follow-up email on something that everyone gets a similar type of well i must i must perhaps correct myself there that that the reply that people get up is based on on similar rules and similar response so that that's consistent and and that's clear and that we sort of that that we review it and make sure that what we say in that email it's clear ev even to people who are non-English uh, speaking as, as their native language. Um, but also that it's flexible enough so that it, it does fit the submission. Um, in the past, we've had the problem where the template replies were, were used a bit too, too uh, pedantically. If pedant identically as a real word um, in other words it wasn't always specifically looked at if if it really fits that what what uh, what it's uh, sent to uh, or the situation it's being sent out for um, now one way we we can make sure that we sort of that that we become consistent in how we reply and how we deal with matters and that that in the past has also been an issue that that people have been unhappy because they feel that this person gets treated different than that person and my situation is handled differently than the other one and why co can this website do this and my website can't do this and so from all these interactions we need to to generate more um, FAQs, more information of, of uh, requests that are that are uh, frequently um, replied to, so that more and more of this becomes a form of self-policing, where the rules and the guidelines are, are clear and they're simple, and the community can guide themselves by following that rules, by following those flowchart. Um, and by them doing that, it reduces then the load, the workload on the trademark team, and the trademark team can spend their time investigating um, abuse of the of of the of the trademark instead of you know, administrator things for um, things that that could have been self self policed by the community. Now, 
some of the tools we we looking at using and uh, to to help us in this process and, and and some of it we've already started using um all the forms that that currently runs through CRM, um that is being moved uh, into the imagma help desk system um the guy who wrote the software, Pedro, is uh, helping us uh, create those new forms, set up the new um, help desk system, the departments in the system, um, and just getting everything set up there for us. Um, the advantage of moving over to this type of help desk system for, for the trademark submissions is that we can that there's both in internal and external tracking of a submission. So you submit a trademark request and you, at the moment, have no clue what's happening to it. You don't know if it's gathering dust in someone's inbox, if it's in someone's spam box, if um, the website was broken at the time that you submitted it and it never actually uh, got uh, through to anyone. So. With the help desk, you can go in and you, you, you immediately after submitting get a reply back with your tracking number. And that tracking number, you can log into the website and see, okay, it's still in the queue or perhaps it's been transferred to someone else to deal with. Um, internally, it's, it can allow different level of, uh, levels of people to deal with requests. So, so we, you can have your frontline people who manage the request and you can have, and, and you can assign them to different departments. So you can have people who, who only deal with the jugs and, and perhaps have a, a slightly different approach in dealing with the jugs. Because we, there are times that we may want to deal a bit differently with, with certain groups in our community and, and I would say Jags and Joomla days or I would fit in that category of, of um, groups or people, organizations that we would like to make extra sure that, that we help them through the process because they, they are people who are helping build the community and help promoting the community in their local level. So, so we want to give them that bit of extra effort to, to um, understand the process and work through the process. Um, it also gives us the ability to have sort of managers above the frontline support so that if there's a, a problem that's not getting sorted out, that uh, submission can be transferred to someone on a higher level that can then look perhaps with a more unbiased view at, at the situation. Um, perhaps it was two personalities that just got a bit heated um, in their communications or there was just some bad, um, often there's language barriers. Some, someone will just misunderstand what someone else said, said in the language because they perhaps using a bit curt language or, or something that may sound unfriendly in, a, in another language. Um, it would even allow us, uh, if we grow the team more, to transfer certain requests to people who can help someone in his or her own language, which I think is a very important thing to, to get to in our, our multi-language, multi-international project, so that we don't forever have everything we do in English, but that we can have resources, human resources that we can say, listen, this is a f guy from, from Spain. Um, he is not understanding what, what we're trying to help with in, him in English. Um, can we transfer it to the Spanish speaking person and they can explain, explain things a bit better in that native language and often just by having someone explain something in, in someone's own native language, it, it resolves a problem much more quickly than, than trying to do it in, in English. Um, continuity and oversight. Um, it's also important that, that we have a system where we can more easily find 
pass requests and how those were handled and and have a easier way to to access historical um, information um, as I mentioned Pedro is helping us uh, set that uh, system up and alongside with that we've also started moving our inter uh, internal communications to uh, a new forum which would again help us to keep better historical track of of what we've discussed before and and uh, find those old um, discussions again um, so thank you that's all from me for now is there any questions i think we we sort of at the end of